Now they're going to go for some final instructions, I think. Is that right, Nick? Somewhat. All right. <laughs> final instructions are getting ready. We're going to turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. God is good. God is good. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing here and the work that you're going to be doing in Orlando this week in the lives of uh, adults and teens from around the country that are, are gathered. I should say around the world. Lord, I know that there are missionary kids that are in the conference. Lord, we just pray again for your work to continue. And as we turn to your word, we ask that you would open our eyes to new things. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been with us, you know that we are studying the book of Ephesians, uh, and we are in the midst of uh, kind of a, a mini-series, if you will, in the, in the book of Ephesians, where Paul is talking about a new way of living. And we are on uh, Ephesians 4.28, or a new way of thinking, excuse me. Um, Ephesians 4.28 says this, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. We're just going to look at this one verse today, but as we do that, I, I want us to back up. I, I want us to back up, because and, and, I realize that, that there are several contexts that every passage of Scripture uh, needs to be seen in. One of the contexts is the context of, of the scriptures and the overall message of the scriptures. The other is our context, the context in which you and I live. And our context is something that we take for granted. It's something that seems perfectly normal to us. We don't see it, we don't feel it, it's just the air that we breathe. But what is it? What is the context that we find ourselves in? Interestingly, a few years ago, some researchers did a study of teenagers and what teenagers think, and believe. Uh, now, where do teenagers get what they think and believe? They get it from home. They get it from school. They get it from church. They get it from the internet. They get it from the world around them. They, they begin absorbing all of the ideas that they've been exposed to, and then they begin talking about them. And the researchers, in looking at these teenagers, came up with a name for what these teenagers across the country believed. And it's a fancy thing that shows that they have PhDs, okay? They called it moralistic, therapeutic, Deism. Can you say that with me? Moralistic, therapeutic, deism. Well, what is that? Well, I'm going to talk about it for a little bit just because I think it helps us understand our context. And I want you to, to, to think about how much of this you agree with. How much of this is inside and you just kind of go, yeah, yep, I buy that. I buy that. The first thing is that God exists. And he created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Our context is not atheistic. The average person 
believes there is a God and that somehow this God created everything. Now, they're going to define how he did it differently. Uh, most people would say that somehow there was a big bang and an evolutionary process, but, but God somehow is, is over all of this. And he watches over. He's, he's paying attention to what we do. This is a typical belief of the average American down the street. God exists. He created everything and he watches over everything. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other. God wants people to be good. He wants people to be nice. And this is something that's held by most religions. By the Bible, but also by the Quran and, and other, other major religions. Hey, be nice to each other. No, try to get along. Now, what this looks like and what is emphasized is, is going to be different. What does it mean to be nice? What does it mean to be good? It may be defined a little bit differently, depending upon which subgroup you belong to. So what this might be, what might be emphasized in subgroups might be following um, a conservative sexuality. Traditional marriage, that's what is defined as good. In another subculture, that might be openness to everyone's expression of sexuality. Whatever that happens to be, that's good. But the subculture defines what good is, and God wants us to be good, nice, and fair. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. That's the goal. <clears throat> what do our founding documents say? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness. The goal of life is to be happy to feel good about yourself. You know what? This will preach. This will preach. <laughs> Messages that, that affirm how good you are, that, that God wants you to be happy, God wants you to be successful, God wants you to be uh, just in love with yourself and, and feeling good about life. That'll preach. It'll draw a crowd. Why? Because in our culture, this is seen as being the central goal. And anything that helps people achieve their goal sells. It'll draw a crowd. God does not need to be particularly involved in life. God is like a butler. You know, you need something, you ring the bell and maybe the butler will bring it. God is like an EMT. You have an accident, something goes wrong, God come and fix it. God, <laughs> catch this, God is like the parent of a teenager. Typical teenager. How involved does a typical teenager want their parent to be in life? Not very. Oh, we're going to go to the mall? Well, can 
you please not walk with me? <laughs> the last thing I want to do is be seen with my parents. On the other hand, Dad, you have any money? <laughs> okay? And, and so, so this is the idea that people have of, of God. You really don't want God too involved because he's kind of a party pooper. Okay? If, if he's there all the time having fun and being happy, ain't going to happen. But he sure is nice to have on call when things go bad. Good people go to heaven when they die. Good people go to heaven when they die. When was the last time you went to the funeral and the pastor stood up and said, Nope, he's not going to be there. <laughs> you, you don't hear that. Because good people go to heaven. And life is hard. And people try. And heaven is kind of the ultimate participation trophy. You participated in life. You didn't become Adolf Hitler. So <coughs> heaven is yours. These five things define moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic in that there are morals, there are things that are believed to be good and right, and we try to do them and get other people to do good and right things. It's therapeutic in that the goal is to be happy and feel good about yourself and and anything we can do to help people be happy and therapeutic is what sells. And it's deistic in that God is there. He created things, but he's not too involved in life. This is what the researchers found those teenagers believe. And this is what those teenagers picked up from the general culture here in America. And it is something that you find as the central message of many, many churches. However, it is not biblical or historic Christianity. Even though churches may teach these things, <clears throat> it is not Christianity as defined by the Bible or has been taught by the church for 2,000 years. It is in many ways a very American phenomenon. Scripture says there is a God. God is holy. He created. He does watch over the earth. He created us to love him, to worship him, to be walking with him in every aspect of our lives, and to love those who bear his image, which is every human being you have ever met. And we have not done either of those things. We didn't even make it through Genesis chapter 3. And God is perfectly just and must punish that rebellion. Good people go to heaven. But we've learned in Ephesians there are no good people. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We compare ourselves to one another. 
And we think, oh, I'm not that bad, you know? I'd come to a complete stop at stop signs. <laughs> I'm a good person. But no, when we compare ourselves to the holiness of God, our righteous acts are like filthy rags. And we're guilty. See, in that moralistic therapy of theism, the whole idea of sin and standing before God and God's judgment is not existent. It's not existent. It doesn't take sin seriously. And therefore, the cross of Christ is not mentioned in moralistic therapy of theism. Because Jesus Christ came as the perfect man, lived his life and never sinned, and died so that your sins might be forgiven. And then God does the work of his spirit and causes you to be born again and you believe and you repent and you turn your life over to Jesus and you start again a new creature in Christ. That's the gospel. That's biblical Christianity. This is what the church has taught <clears throat> since the resurrection. Not moralistic, therapeutic deism, but instead we are sinners desperately in need of salvation, which God provided in Christ for those who repent and believe the gospel. He has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And now we need to learn how to walk in the kingdom of light. We need to learn how to think the way God wants us to think. And that's what we're involved in here in this section of Ephesians. And the danger is we can just look at this and say, okay, I don't steal. I'm good. And just latch on to our culture's idea of moralistic therapeutic deism and not see what God is really calling us to here. It says, let the thief no longer steal. What does it mean to steal? What does it mean? What, what's your definition? Someone give me a definition. Okay. Taking something that's not yours. Simple enough. Taking something that's not yours. So if you're doing that, knock it off. <laughs> Why? Well, one of the commandments is, thou shalt not steal. You steal, you get in trouble with God. It's a pretty good reason not to steal, isn't it? You know, it's interesting, I, I talk to a lot of people, um, and, and, and I'll ask them, why not steal? Why, why not steal? And often, the reason they give is the civil penalties. If I steal, there's a chance I could get caught, and getting caught stealing would be embarrassing. I might fight face prosecution, pay a fine, go to jail. All these negative things could happen if I steal. So I won't steal. Then I ask the question, well, let's just set up a scenario here. You're walking past a bank. It's nighttime. There's no one around. The front door is open. The vault is open. The security system is off. There is a wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> and you can go in and take all 
all that money, and no one will ever know. Would you do it? Would you do it? Different scenario. Brand new iPhone. You could steal it, and no one would ever know that you didn't buy it, would you? Or is it the risk of getting caught that keeps you from doing it? When my son was little, um, we bought a basketball and had it in the driveway. It was one of these, these basketball hoops that you didn't put in the ground. Um, it had the heavy base that we filled up with, with water um, so that you could would stack it up. And we had our, our house recited. And they, they brought a big dumpster and they were having a hard time maneuvering and finally got it into the driveway and I said, oh, if I had known, you know, I was at work, if I had known, it'd be pretty simple. We could just tip the, the thing over, drain the water out of the, out of the thing, and move the basketball over. It's been a lot easier for you. Two days later, the basketball hoop was gone. Someone tipped it over, drained the water out of it. You can see where they had wheeled it to the, to the curb, put it in the back of their truck. <laughs> My son was devastated. And as a father, I'm trying to explain to him that there are people in the world that do stuff like that. See, that thief did not care at all for my son. That thief was perfectly willing to take what did not belong to him because he did not care. The reason we don't steal isn't because there is a rule that says, do not steal. God put that rule in force because we don't understand love. All of the commandments are built on loving God and loving one another. And so the gospel comes in and says, you're guilty. You're guilty. You can be forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross, but you need to repent and begin to learn what it means to love. So if you're stealing, don't steal. Not because there's a rule that says you shall not steal and you'll get in trouble if you get caught, but because taking somebody's iPhone is not love. Not only that, <laughs> Shouldn't you not steal? Get to work. Do something useful, something good, something honest with your own hands. Work is not something that is a punishment. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were put in the garden and told to work, to care for it. And so the idea that, that work is somehow a curse is wrong. We were built to work. And so this passage says, don't steal. Instead, find something useful to do with your own hands. Work. That word means labor, toil, Jesus, after walking all day, showed up at a, wheat, at a well in Samaria, exhausted because he had worked that whole day by walking. So, Scripture tells us, work. Work. Do something useful with your own hands. Now, 
I don't know what your version of the Bible says here. I, I, I've been looking through a various <coughs> versions. And in none of the versions do I see an age exception here. Is this yours? <laughs> See, we are called to work, to do something useful with our hands, our entire lives. In American culture, we say, work till 65, then play golf. <laughs> Collect seashells, you know, just uh, relax. But that's not scriptural. The Bible says work. Now, does that mean that you have to do a nine-to-five job your entire life? No. But it means that you put yourself to good use. You put yourself to good use. Do something productive. So that you're not dependent on others. Man, I just love this. I, I just love it. Okay, me. But stealing, stealing isn't very loving. Work. Instead of, instead of stealing somebody's iPhone or robbing a bank, work. Do something useful. So that you can give it away. <laughs> so that you can give it away. So that when someone else has a need, you have something to give them. You have something to give them. And you know, it, it, it's not that you necessarily are giving out of your excess. It's that you, you have something on hand that can meet their need. And so you give. Why? Because there's a rule that says Christians give. No. Because we are consumed by the love of God and the love for those who were born in his image. And so when we see someone in need, we are moved with compassion and do what we can to help. It is a transformation in our way of thinking about life. That life isn't about getting everything we can and hoarding it for ourselves, even taking things from other people. No, it's instead doing something useful, something productive, doing honest work, so that we can not only meet our own needs, but also the needs of other people. That's what Jesus calls us to. That's part of the new way of living as a follower of Christ. for our 
willingness to work, for our willingness to toil, yes. and for our willingness to share the fruits of our labor with those in need. The Lord, you say that we will be known for our love. 